Yeah, thanks very much for the introduction and thanks for the invitation to come and, and chat with you guys today. About, you know, this is the first time I've been here. Uh, and I think it's you know, an excellent opportunity for students and postdocs to try and learn a bunch of sort of these synthesis techniques sort of compiled all in sort of one place, right? There's not <coughs> many courses that teach a lot of the stuff that's covered here, so this is a, a good opportunity. Um, so, yeah, as Jean Pierre mentioned, uh, I'm uh, in the materials department at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Um, and our group does a mixture of um, bulk. You know, different types of bulk crystal synthesis techniques, but in particular, lately we've been working on high pressure floating zone techniques. And I'll tell you a little bit about them uh, as, as the talk goes on. Uh, great, so let's get started. So just sort of an overview of what I'd like to present to you today is also, uh, since this is really sort of the first talk dedicated to floating zone, I'll just give you a quick overview of the technique itself, what it is, what are the sort of the relevant parameters that you're dealing with when you're dealing with floating zone, uh, and what are some of the different variants, for instance, can you start to deal with not only congruently melting materials, but incongruently melting materials, as some of the earlier talks uh, mentioned with flux to growth techniques. Uh, you can sort of, you can incorporate some of these techniques into the floating zone method as well. And then one of the things that I like about floating zone is that it's actually, I mean, it's, to me, it's a very instrument driven kind of technique, right? You have a very, uh, there's many different types of, of, of furnaces and they sort of all have sort of their own flavor of advantages or disadvantages. Um, <clears throat> and so I'll, I'll try and cover what are some of the standard sort of floating zone furnace types that you might encounter. Um, and then I'll uh, segue into the high pressure floating zone, which I think uh, <coughs> is a, a newer frontier that's been developing over the past, uh, say, five, six years or so. Um, great. All right, so let's get started. So first off, uh, when I start talking about some of our floating zone work, uh, the students and postdocs who have done the lion's share of the work is, first of all, Julian Schmer, who was a postdoc in my group. Now he's uh, in an X-ray detector company in Germany, uh, really spearheaded our development project of a high-pressure floating zone furnace. Uh, and Eli, who's a graduate student in my group currently, has, has really helped Julian quite a lot with that, and now he's taking over, and he's the lead of our, our high-pressure uh, growth efforts now. And we've also had uh, really a remarkable undergraduate, Michael Ayling, in our group, who <coughs> helped with a lot of... Uh, the design work along the way, who's now uh, pursuing his master's degree at Cambridge. <coughs> okay. So first off, just so what is, you know, what's the history of floating zone? Okay, so this is a technique that was developed uh, sort of simultaneously by William Fan and Henry Thur, as well as Paul Keck. Um, and it was developed as a means of remotely uh, melting and recrystallizing a material. So for instance, semiconducting materials, which was the original motivator for it. Um, and when I say remotely, I mean <clears throat> you're melting a material, as Brian mentioned earlier, uh, without actually touching it, okay? So the melt itself is suspended by the surface tension. So for instance, you have some feed material, some polycrystalline stock, for instance. Uh, let's just say this is semiconducting silicon, for, for instance. And then you have some localized heating zone that you, that you generate, uh, and you melt the material here, and the melt is just held in place via the surface tension, okay? And this is the, the, that's why it's floating, okay? So it's a floating molten zone. And then as you translate this molten zone along the feed material, uh, as the material recrystallizes, it crystallizes onto a, to a seed crystal, and you can pull a large volume single crystal via this technique, <coughs> okay? It's a high purity technique, and it was uh, really the seminal technique in advancing semiconductor purity. So if you can create bulk crys uh, crystalline material, with uh, impurity concentrations less than 1 ppb, for instance, uh, and, and that was th the in initial demonstrations were in germanium and then in silicon. Uh, and the initial sort of design concept of this is that you had uh, <clears throat> a focusing plate where you had uh, basically a field concentrator for RF induction melting, and you just take a feedstock through it, and you basically, uh, as, as it goes through, you melt the silicon or germanium, and as you pull down through, uh, this melt recrystallizes onto your seed crystal. Okay, um, and here's some picture of a guy in the 50s at Bell Labs, or late, late 50s, early 60s, staring at this probably uncomfortably close. Uh, but he's got goggles on, but I don't know about the rest of his face. It's, it's pretty hot. <laughs> um, I wouldn't recommend doing that when you guys do your practical uh, later today. Uh, okay. Okay, so the other key component, I mean, I mentioned that the, 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 the zone is suspended via surface tension, and uh, that's a crucible-free method, so basically you don't have any solvent action of the melt on, uh, on the crucible material, so you're not picking up impurities from that. But the second uh, active ingredient is really what was pioneered by William Fahn in the, in the early 50s, is the idea of zone refining, okay? And so the idea is simple, is if I have some material that has some solute concentration, uh, as that solute concentration increases, the melting point of the material can change, okay? 
Okay, and so that means is that basically as I as I solidify a crystal from a melt, then <clears throat> I will have there will be a tendency to expel the solute into the melt and, and to basically cre create a concentration gradient, okay, as I resolidify, okay. So then the idea then is that I, I can move the molten zone across the solid and I can drive the impurities or the solutes from one side of the solid to the other, okay, so this is zone refining. And you can keep doing this over and over again, as Brian mentioned earlier in his talk, and you can cre you basically you can drive this impurity concentration for, to one side or the other. Okay, so this concept of zone refining is one of the, the, the uh, under, uh, concepts that underpins why floating zone is sort of an ultra high purity bulk crystal growth technique. Okay, okay, so what are the advantages of floating zone? So why would you consider using it? First of all, it's crucible free. Uh, so that's, as I mentioned earlier, so basically uh, the molten zone attacking whatever container it's in it, you can sort of remove that degree of freedom, which was, that was the original advance when they first made semiconductor grade silicon, for instance. Uh, this is, you know, basically they've been trying, I think, Tchaikovsky of growth that wasn't working because they're picking up contaminants from the, uh, from the crucible. So you can basically remove that degree of uncertainty. Um, it's high purity because of the zone refining technique, as I mentioned earlier. And also, it's an active technique, meaning this is a crystal growth technique that you can actually monitor and adjust. And in fact, you must monitor and adjust as it, as it, as it proceeds. Okay? So this is something you actually actively participate in. You don't put it into a furnace, put in a heating sequence, and then leave for a week. Right? You actually have to monitor the growth process. <coughs> Uh, another advantage is it's a large volume technique, as Brian mentioned earlier, a lot of neutron scatterers tend to like this because you can get cubic centimeter volume crystals if you're successful, and that's for inelastic neutron scattering, that's a, a big advantage. Um, <clears throat> and it's a seeded technique, so basically you can start, if you have a seed crystal, you can start and almost, you know, very soon get a usable single crystal that's been seeded, okay? <clears throat> okay. It works for both low melting point and high melting point materials. So this, some of this comes into which type of furnace you're using, but it's very versatile, okay? Uh, for instance, arc melting, for instance, is not so easy to use with low melting point materials. Um, okay, and also it works with fluxes and incongru incongruently melting systems, as I'll mention in a second, via the so-called traveling solvent floating zone technique. Okay, and here's just a picture of, you know, mapping <laughs> what this sort of general concept is here, right? I have some feedstock of material, and in this case, it's not an inductively uh, driven uh, melt zone, it's an optically driven melt zone via focused halogen bulbs into some central hot zone where you've mul you, you melt this feed material into a molten zone, and then here's the pooled crystal you've pulled from it below. Okay, in this case, it's sodium manganese O2. Okay, so, uh, okay, so no technique is a cure-all for everything. There are limitations of floating zone. Uh, as what, one that I don't have listed here, but as Brian mentioned earlier, is it takes a while, okay? It's a lot of preparation work. It's really something you probably want to think about doing for very targeted crystal growth, okay? You have a system that's exciting and you really want to perfect the, the material, uh, then it's, very, you know, it's a really high payoff for that. But if you're just doing a lot of exploratory synthesis, this is not the fastest way to do things. Um, an another limitation is the zone stability is really par paramount in the technique, okay? Um, so what does that mean? Is that means that I, have, I melt a system and I have to ha be able to maintain a stable molten zone, okay? And a good rule of thumb is you want the aspect ratio to be something like one to one, okay? You don't want it to be too stretched, for instance, okay? Then it'll collapse because the, uh, really the surface tension is what's saving this technique and allowing it to work. So what's that mean? That means low viscosity melts can be different, uh, can, be, can be difficult to deal with. <coughs> so if I have a, a high density uh, or a high melt, a high density melt, basically the surface tension can't always suspend the melt, for instance. Um, additionally, volatile species that become problematic, you lose material from the melt as a function of time, and this will get thinner and thinner, and can change, it can also change the chemistry of what you're doing. Okay? A second problem, you know, uh, challenge that can be encountered is you actually have to couple whatever your heating source is remotely into the material, and that's not always straightforward. For instance, if you're dealing with metal, sometimes the reflectivity of the melt or the material itself is a big factor. Uh, for instance, uh, in optical floating zone, if you're just trying to uh, deal with a, uh, an intermetallic system, uh, you can lose a lot of the light that you're focusing into the, into the molten zone. Similarly, for metals, you know, conduction of heat away from the molten zone can be a problem. I mean, it can, can stretch out the zone if, you're, if, you're, if, all you're, if you can't maintain a tight molten zone and then, then the zone collapses. Okay, so. Since it's a highly non-equilibrium process, you have very sharp thermal gradients involved because you have a, you know, basically something that's molten over something this is typically maybe, uh, say, five millimeters or six millimeters uh, in height. 
Uh, so you have a very sharp thermal gradients that can vary from, say, 50 C per millimeter to some laser diode driven furnaces that can be up to, you know, several hundred degrees Celsius per millimeter. Uh, and those sharp thermal gradients can lead to uh, a degradation of the microstructure of your crystal. So you can have thermal cracking sometimes, uh, depending on the, if it's a, a very refractory system. That often can be a problem that you have to try and mitigate. Sometimes that can be mitigated via installing things like so-called after heaters. So you can install on the grown crystal side. As you pull this down, you could put like a, a resistive furnace down here that basically extends your thermal gradient down here and actually anneals and tries to heal a lot of this microstructure degradation as you grow. And so here's just an example of an after heater, after heater system where basically you would pull the crystal through this furnace as you go through. And this is made by crystal systems. Um, okay, so another limitation is that uh, processing gas environments can be constrained in standard systems. Okay, so standard systems are typically running around an atmosphere of pressure um, but I will, the caveat is that recent advances basically have shown that you can go from ultra high vacuum 10 to the minus 7 pascal all the way to 10 to the 8 pascal now in growth environments. So I think this is a limitation that's been lifted in the past five or six years. <clears throat> okay. Okay, so what are the growth parameters? What are we typically thinking about when we're, when, we're, when we're doing floating zone growth? So for congruently melting systems, meaning the system that I melt is the system that recrystallizes, um, the first thing is, first of all, you have to make sure you have the appropriate growth atmosphere for the chemistry you're after. And also, obviously, you need the requisite heating power to actually melt whatever the feed material is. Okay? And the other two parameters are the rate at which you translate the, the feedstock down and also the rate at which you, you grow the crystal, the growth rate, so the seed translation rate, okay? So you really have an upper, upper uh, shaft, this, is a, uh, this feedstock is attached, attached to a shaft that, that, uh, that's on a, a stepper motor with some transmission, uh, and the seed crystal is uh, attached to another shaft. Uh, they can also have a different translation rate. Typically, uh, this is uh, in the standard furnaces. Some furnaces actually, instead of actually translating the feed, uh, uh, the, the seed crystal, you actually translate the molten zone, the heating zone itself, by moving a mirror assembly up. <coughs> uh, I'll show you some of this in a second. Um, okay, so the translation rates of the upper and lower uh, shafts, but then also the rotation of the feed and uh, seed crystals as a, as, a, uh, as a function of the growth uh, process. For instance, uh, for instance, they're often counter-rotated during the growth, uh, so you get ac uh, adequate mixing within the molten zone. Okay, so this is a, kind of like a homogenization and mixing parameter. Okay, another thing uh, that's often tuned is a the thermal gradient. Basically, how sharp is uh, the thermal gradient across the molten zone? So, as I mentioned earlier, you can try and extend this on the on the uh, seed crystal side by putting in this after heater furnace that'll help mitigate things like thermal cracking. Um, other ways of doing that is you can actually try and, if it's an optical floating zone, you can try and tailor the light field by, for instance, uh, if it's coming out of a mirror, you can try and tilt the mirror, for instance, to extend it. Uh, you can actually uh, have tailored optics to try and control the, the, uh, the uh, basically the heating profile in the molten zone. Uh, if you're doing an RF, if you're doing an induction melter <coughs> a floating zone, then you can have field concentrators to try and control the heating field. So these are all parameters that you can play with and that depend on which kind of furnace you're using, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, so why are the feed and uh, seed uh, growth rates something that you really play with? Um, so first of all, here's just sort of a typical picture, right? So you have some polycrystalline seed and I'm going to feed it down into the hot zone which is fixed, okay? So I have some, let's say for instance, light that's being focused here that's uh, heating things up. And then I'm pulling uh, the seed crystal down at the same rate, okay? So then what will happen is, of course, I'll melt the feed material and I'll recrystallize it at a crystallization growth front here at the bottom, okay? As, as basically as the, the material cools below its melting point. All right. Um, but because the feed material is some polycrystalline thing, it actually has, um, it doesn't have an ideal density, okay? So it has a, a lower density than the, the crystalline material, so you'll actually have some narrowing. As you, as, you, as you do this, okay? So you'll have a, a grown crystal with a smaller diameter than your feed, feed uh, rod, typically. Uh, so then, for instance, one thing you can do is you can actually, you, can, you translate the feed uh, stock slightly faster to try and compensate for this and to try and square up your molten zone. That's one thing you can do. But another thing you could potentially do is you can also translate the seed uh, crystal down faster to actually try and uh, th uh, thin out the molten zone. And so why you'd want to do that? So what you can do is what's called necking. And necking can be used for grain selection. Okay, so I, I don't know if you noticed, but in Brian's talk earlier, he had these very fancy uh, glass-blown um, 
ampules for bridgeman growth, right? And was, they had a very sharp tip, and then some of them went out and came back in and went out and came back in, right? So that's just a bridgeman way of necking, okay? So that's to try and gr uh, select grains. And so you can do the same. You can kind of uh, imitate this process as a function of time uh, during your growth, where you can basically vary the molten zone from being something fat to something thin, fat to thin, back and forth. And that's a way of actually trying to select a dominant grain in your growth, okay? Because you don't always start with a, with a seed crystal that's a single crystal, so you don't always start growing a single crystal. Sometimes if you're just starting with a new system, you have to start with just a polycrystal seed, okay? So you start with a, for instance, uh, uh, a, uh, a, f uh, a seed material that's the same as the starting polycrystalline feed material. Uh, and then as you grow, of course, eventually one grain will try and dominate, right? And if you keep growing long enough, eventually uh, just uh, via the surface energy, you'll, you'll, you'll have one primary grain that you pull, but that could take a long time. <laughs> and uh, you might want to try and optimize this or you try and uh, speed it up by doing this necking process, right? Where if somewhere along the way, you basically narrow things. You can try and pick out one grain and, and have it grow. Okay? All right. All right, so uh, as Brian mentioned er earlier also in his talk is that a big part of floating zone growth is the, the preparation of the feed rod. It's actually one of the more, you know, it's, it's, it's a little uh, subtle and insidious because it actually controls a lot of your potential for success, okay? So I'm just drawing pictures of these feed rods, right, that we're, that we're putting in to grow our crystals with, but you actually have to make them. Um, and you actually have to make them in, in high density and reasonably uniform, okay? Um, and 90%, you know, this is a, a you know, aspirational goal. You, you kind of want a density greater than 90% of theoretical density, uh, where if you just mix powder, right, you guys know that you something like around 50 to 60% density, right? So you really need to densify the thing so you don't get all this air and other things inside of your, uh, of your melt, okay? And so there's various ways of doing that. Um, and this is usually the stuff of students' nightmares, you know, trying to make a straight rod and then carefully, uh, you know, extracting it and centering it and then trying to uh, not break it along the way, okay? So once you have an adequately long rod, you know, these rods, depending on the type of furnace, they go from something like, say, some people make them eight millimeters in diameter down to, say, our, our group typically works with four millimeters in diameter for high pressure work. Uh, but then you want them to be, you know, let's say five, six inches long, right? So it has a very uh, large aspect ratio like that. Uh, so the typical preparation route routes for these rods, uh, there's, there's really three. I'd say the most common is just to, to, to uh, take a, a balloon or, or a rubber mold that you've had made uh, and to fill it and then to do a cold isostatic press of that to basically compress the powder within the, within the balloon. Uh, and then to take it out, extract it from whatever, you know, either the balloon or the, or the rubber mold, and then center that uh, in whatever gas environment you want. And so the center process could be something like hanging it inside of a vertical furnace so that you only, it only touches a, a wire, like a platinum wire that you've t attached around the top, or it could be laying it on a, a, an aluminum boat in, a, in, a, in a, a vertical tube furnace, for instance. Dep it just depends on the actual process you're, you're interested in. Um, I'm happy to talk to any of you about details of this. Uh, if you're interested, uh, everyone has their own sort of preferences on how this is best done. Uh, my students all do it slightly different from one another. It's really, uh, this, this can be one of the more involved processes. There will be some coverage of this in the practical. Right, okay. All right, so then you get a taste of it. Um, there are others uh, who can do uh, single step preparation routes. For instance, you could just hot press the rod directly or uh, a very good way of densifying materials if you can find the processing uh, equipment uh, and if it's suitable for your particular materials, you can do spark plasma sintering and then just start doing some surface polish to remove uh, carbon contamination later. Um, another method of preparing highly dense rods is to actually use the floating zone furnace itself. So basically you press a rod and then you suspend it within your furnace and then you very quickly translate it through the hot zone that you've created, okay? And so you can kind of so-called pre-melting it, okay? And so you can actually get very high density rods via this way. Um, and the advantage there is that you can access very high processing temperatures without the rod actually touching anything again, okay? So that's an, another advantage. Okay. All right. So what about incongruently melting materials? Those can be done with floating zone as well. Um, here's just a generic phase diagram <coughs> where you have some uh, pseudo-binary going from some compound A to some compound AB, 
Uh, and let's say you're interested in uh, growing uh, a variant of A2B. Um, <coughs> Then, of course, you know, as, as Brian and Weiwei earlier mentioned, you can access this paratectic line, right? And then as you cool through here, you can uh, crystallize A2B out of the melt. All right? So one way of doing... So we know that, that this works with like, flux growth, right? So how does it work with, traveling, with floating zone? So with floating zone, you switch to a mode called traveling solvent floating zone with the idea of being you can take your, your target flux concentration and you put it sort of just on top of whatever your seed material is. Uh, this is very... I'm kind of just doing a quick overview of this. <laughs> uh, you translate this into the hot zone and melt it, and then you join the, the uh, feed rod into the, the flux, and then as you grow, A2B dissolves into the flux and A2B solidifies out, okay? As long as you grow slow enough that, this, that the A2B can uh, diffuse through the molten zone, then you can actually have the, the solvent or the flux actually travel along in the molten zone, okay? So traveling solvent floating zone, okay? That's the idea here. Um, other ways of, of, of dealing with this is people also do so-called self-adjusted flux technique. I, I think this is more or less people who succeed by accident. <laughs> uh, you know, you, you start somewhere out here and just by expelling a, a B, for instance, out of, the, uh, out of the melt, you eventually hit this paratactic line and then you get some region of your crystal that actually works, okay? So this actually, this, is, this, is, this actually is a good way of just exploring around to see if you can get something that works. Um, other ways are so-called flux feeding techniques where you can actually take the flux itself and incorporate it into the feed rod itself. Okay, so as you, as you actually grow, you introduce additional flux into the melt, which can also compensate for losses during the growth if it's a volatile material. Okay, all right, so this is just a quick, quick summary. Uh, this is a very, a very rich field in itself, just all of the intricacies of traveling solvent floating zone, for instance. But just to, just to tell you that incongruently mat melting materials are accessible with floating zone techniques. Uh, yeah. It is like this one sample is like equivalently melting and having uh, the bed, near to the peritactic temperature if we have uh, many different competing another phases, uh, except that we are material which we want to grow, then what are the parameters we need to take care of? Ah, okay. Um, then typically, uh, if there's many other competing phases, then having a very sharp thermal gradient is, is going to help stabilize the one you want. Uh, so the, uh, so typical, I mean, the a, a canonical example of that is, for instance, bismuth iron oxide um, is a material that uh, with sort of radiation or, you know, lamp-based floating zone is very hard to stabilize a phase pure bismuth iron oxide crystal. Um, however, if you switch to a laser-based heating where you have a very sharp thermal gradient, then you can nucleate ver uh, very pure single crystals of the material. So I think the thermal gradient is probably the dominant parameter in that case and, and slow translation, yeah. Okay, great. So, okay, so that's sort of a quick overview. Okay, so what types of furnaces are there? Okay, so most induction furnaces are used for commercial applications, so I'm not really gonna talk about them uh, in this talk. Uh, instead, I'll be talking about what I, I call research grade furnaces because they're very good for looking at different types of materials, very, uh, for exploratory materials uh, synthesis. Um, <clears throat> and these are primarily optically driven, okay? So uh, of these, there's a, a mirror image furnace and a laser-based furnace, and I'll talk about the two of them. So here's an, uh, just a picture of uh, a lamp-based furnace with mirrors. Okay, this is a crystal systems four mirror furnace. This is probably what you'll see in your practical tour. Okay, this looked like it was a picture of it. <laughs> so you guys will see this much more in, in, in depth, but just sort of to calibrate you, what you will see is that it's really comprised of only three major uh, uh, systems. The first is a feed system, right? This is just a, you, you can see here there are just um, two guide shafts and then there's a plate joining them and on top of that there is a, sh a feed shaft with a stepper motor, right? So then basically this plate moves along these guides and, and translates this feed shaft through the center of the furnace. The same on the bottom, it's a seed shaft which translates up and down here. Oh, actually I think in this case the, sorry, the crystal systems is the anomaly. The seed shaft doesn't move, the, the mirror assembly moves up and down. And anyway, <clears throat> you'll, you'll see that. Uh, if I look here at the mirror assembly, uh, basically these, the, uh, the, two, the backs of the two mirrors you're facing, facing us right now open up, and there's four mirrors inside, and the, and the focal point of each mirror is a halogen light bulb. So here's just a <clears throat> sort of a schematic of the growth chamber itself. I would just look at two mirrors here focusing in, 
Here's the hot zone with the feed and seed material. Uh, contained around that is, our, uh, is a, um, a, a totally transparent quartz cylinder, which uh, contains our growth environment. And then there's basically uh, gasket seals that seal the uh, upper translation shaft and lower translation shaft so they can translate through a seal into the growth environment, okay? And so inside of this is where you introduce whatever your, your, your processing gas is <coughs> for your crystal growth. Okay. There are different types of mirror assemblies. So he, the, the first two I hear I'm showing you are the so-called four mirror. That's what I just showed you. This is a, a horizontal geometry where we're, basically as we're looking in at the plane of the, of the projector of the slide here, we're looking down along the shaft. So these are the four mirrors in the plane. Uh, <coughs> uh, you can look at the heating profile as you would expect as you basically rotate about. The growth, uh, the growth axis, basically you'll get an oscillation w as you translate b across each focal point here for each mirror. Uh, alternatively, uh, a number of different furnaces use only two mirrors. Uh, same concept, you just have a two-fold oscillation in the plane. Um, a different design uh, is to use a, a so-called vertical geometry. So now your, your growth shafts actually move along the, the laser pointer line here. Uh, and your your, your, your hot zone is here, and but below your hot zone is a, a single reflector with a single light bulb that, that focuses up onto its upper reflector that then uh, focuses into your hot zone, okay? So the idea, I mean, the, one of the advantages, uh, it's not, there's, there are some caveats, is that basically as you rotate along the growth axis in, in this particular vertical geometry, is that you have a, a very uniform temperature gradient. Okay, so you don't get this oscillation that you get from discrete points of having the, the lamps actually in the, in the, in the plane. So, uh, which was the better configuration, better design? Uh, you know, I think you ask different people, you'll get different answers. Uh, so, certainly, uh, if you want to grow a large diameter single crystal, um, I would say the four mirror in, uh, horizontal in plane Geometry has been demonstrated to really kind of give you sort of people can get one centimeter diameter crystals with that. Um, <clears throat> for low power applications, uh, a lot of people prefer the two mirror because they can get a much sharper thermal gradient typically. Um, uh, but but some people will argue back and forth between these two. Um, this vertical geometry has a, uh, some advantages. Uh, this is nice. Um, <clears throat> However, uh, the caveat here is that the, the companies that make this typically use a xenon source here and not a halogen bulb. <clears throat> and I'll, I'll explain that in a second. But in order to actually like, uh, control the light at low powers with a xenon source, you have to introduce a shutter here. And that actually then starts to modify this profile a bit. <clears throat> if you rotate the feed and seed rod, then probably this uh, oscillation will be... Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, uh, yes. Okay, so okay, what are the light sources for lamps, uh, for, for lamp-driven uh, uh, floating zone furnaces? So the first uh, a typical one, uh, both of these are, are basically rela related to projectors, right? So an overhead projector bulb, halogen light bulbs, you can typically find these that go from 100 watts to uh, 1.5 kilowatts. Um, and with an array of these, you can usually reach, uh, uh, you, at the upper, end, up, upper power range, you can reach 2100 degrees Celsius. Um, <clears throat> with uh, good low T control. So at low power, you still have pretty good control for the halogen light bulbs, okay? The drawback is, um, <clears throat> as you scale to higher power the halogen light bulbs, you have to put a bigger and bigger filament in the bulbs. And that bigger and bigger filament occupies a larger space in, in your focusing mirror, so you have a poor focus, and that basically ends up extending, and your, your thermal gradient becomes less sharp, okay? You have a, a less well-defined hot zone, okay? That's a typical trade-off that you have. Okay, so then you can say, fine, well, I want to switch to xenon lamps. Okay, so okay, xenon, you get much higher power. You can go from five, for instance, to 15 kilowatt bulbs, and these are like movie, pro movie projector bulbs. Um, and with these, uh, you typically can reach temperatures of up to about 20, 2,800 Celsius. Um, but the typical trade-off here is that the low T threshold, basically, for these, you have r rather poor control 
of the power delivery for lower temperatures. Okay, so um, this can be mitigated, as I was mentioning earlier, with some new furnace, furnace designs coming from uh, Scientific Instruments of Dresden, where you use a shutter system to try and basically leave this on at some uh, above threshold power, but then simply just uh, mask the, the light down. Okay, so here's some common mirror furnace vendors that produce uh, furnaces with these types of geometries. <coughs> Uh, so the first here is uh, so Scientific Instru Instruments of Dresden, Cidre. Uh, they, they produce uh, the vertical geometry furnaces, which are adapted from an old Russian design. Um, I'll talk more about these in a second. Um, <coughs> uh, uh, another one, uh, probably the more common deployment uh, you see nowadays, is uh, crystal systems, uh, which have, they create a, a variety of different horizontal geometry furnaces. Okay, these are, they typically uh, market four mirror furnaces. Uh, this is in Japan. Uh, in the US, Quantum Design uh, sells both two and four mirror horizontal geometry furnaces. And there's a French company, uh, Cyberstar, that sells uh, two mirror horizontal geometry furnaces. And there used to be NEC, which became Canon, that did two mirror furnaces, but I don't know if they still make them anymore, <laughs> actually. I tried looking, uh, they don't really have a web presence, so I, you know, with, with nowadays, I think that means they don't make them. All right. Okay, so another way of heating the sample optically is to instead of saying I want to take a broadband source from like a halogen or a xenon bulb and focusing it via a mirror, you could say, well, what if I just want to shoot lasers at it, okay? And so this is an old idea, actually. I mean, the laser-based idea for floating zone, uh, I think the first paper I could find is uh, by Gasson and uh, Cockaine, I think is in the UK, in 1970, which is only six years after the high power uh, carbon dioxide laser was first invented, okay? And look at this, look at this, this geometry, right? They have, how, let's say one, two, three, four, five, six, they have like 12 carbon dioxide lasers in a bank that are 10 meters long, okay? And they take these guys and they focus them into two beams and they come into a chamber and basically incoming beam from each of these uh, trains of, uh, of CO2 gas lasers is, uh, from each of them is only offset by I think like one, one and a half degrees or something. So it's a really bold measurement, okay? <laughs> I mean, there's a high probability that's going to shine and destroy all their lasers. But anyway, so uh, they used this and they created a, basically a laser-driven floating zone and it was targeted at growing refractory materials. And so in their furnace, they actually had an iridium furnace winding to preheat the material they wanted to deal with. And then they brought the CO2 laser light in and then they pulled it in a floating zone uh, a fashion. So basically here they grew alumina, ca uh, calcium zirconate, and yttria. So um, it was a, basically a combination of, of two 400 watt laser banks and uh, a, a resistance furnace. So I think this is you know, interesting. Okay, so you know, more recently uh, with the advent of high powered laser diodes, uh, there was a very nice paper in 2013 showing that you can use these high powered laser diodes and this is just adapted into a crystal systems four mirror furnace basically rip the four mirrors out and put these da laser diode banks in um, <clears throat> and this is uh, demonstrating this bismuth iron oxide basically uh, by using the sharper gradient that you can uh, achieve via laser diode heating uh, then you can actually stabilize crystal uh, systems that were previously very problematic for uh, floating zone due to competing phases. And the idea is you just take a, a diode stack, you put the light from the diode stack, and the, in their case they put it into a light pipe, which is diffuses the light onto the molten zone, into the, into the, into the center point, and they have, in their, in their case they had seven, I think, they used. And with seven, they calculated you can get a very uniform in-plane heating density. Okay. And there's multiple commercial systems uh, with laser diodes now available. For instance, Crystal Systems and also Scientific Instruments of Dresden offer these. Okay. All right. Is seven, uh, is that what everyone uses or are they use? No, I think Crystal Systems now uses five. I think five is fine. Uh, yeah. I think uh, if you calculate three, then it starts to get a little wonky. But <clears throat> okay. All right, so now I'll talk to you about high pressure floating zone, okay? Um, so I, I guess the way that I have this structured is I'll review a bit about what we define high pressure floating zone to be and what sort of the state of the art is, and then I'll talk to you a bit about, about what we've been working on in terms of trying to develop high pressure floating zone further. Okay, so first off, you need to qualify this, what is high pressure, okay? So historically, commercial systems for floating zones 
uh, systems, for instance, the, uh, the mirror-driven systems I showed you earlier, were constrained to uh, a 10 atmosphere gas environment, okay? And historically, if you were ordering it, you had to say, ah, that's the high pressure option, okay? So that's 0 0.001 GPA. But we all know that there's other furnaces, for instance, high pressure multi-anvil furnaces can reach 20 GPA and diamond anvil cells can go hundreds of GPA, okay? So we have to be a little careful what we mean by high pressure. Okay, <clears throat> so a high pressure floating zone now, I would say, is typically defined as being pressures greater than 0 0.01 GPA or 100 atmospheres, okay? Roughly, okay? All right, so why is that interesting, okay? It's not a very high pressure on an absolute scale. Um, <clears throat> because it opens new windows for growing now with floating zone, so the idea of trying to get ultra high purity crystals of large volume of materials that were pre previously inaccessible to the technique, okay? And so that includes materials that are volatile, in some cases metastable, but the idea of being able to modify the phase diagrams by controlling the chemical potential of a reactive gas, for instance, uh, for, and incongruently melting materials can make certain systems much more tractable. Um, so the idea is you can control the chemical potential, the oxidation state and phase formation. And for instance, if we're thinking of oxides, right? High pressure oxygen has a big impact on the phase diagram. Okay. So there's already a lot of frontiers that are being opened in high pressure floating zone. Here's some notable examples in oxides. For instance, rare earth nicolates, which are uh, of broad interest now because of the reports of high temperature superconductivity. Um, these guys need to be grown under high pressure oxygen uh, with floating zone. Uh, other examples, this is a, uh, a quantum spin chain system, lithium 2 copper O2, which has some interesting Zhang Rice singlet physics. Um, here's another rare earth nicolate. This is by John Mitchell's group, where again, the idea is trying to stabilize high temperature superconductivity or un unconventional superconductivity in that material. Uh, and here's a, uh, this quantum paraelectric that Brian mentioned earlier that came out of Oak Ridge. I mean, there's many others, I'm just listing a few, okay? Um, high pressure floating zone systems in the installations in the U.S. that I'm aware of, there's one in Argonne National Lab at 150 atmospheres, one in Oak Ridge National Lab at 150 atmospheres. Um, there's one at Johns Hopkins University under the umbrella of the NSF National Science Foundation's Paradigm Facility, which can go to 300 atmospheres, and these three guys are all manufactured by Scientific Instruments of Dresden. Okay, and they look something like this. This is a picture from uh, John Mitchell's lab. They're big instruments. Okay, so this is a, I think this is a 150 atmosphere version. Um, and then I, you know, okay, I get to list ours. Uh, so we recently, uh, early last year, finished developing our, our high pressure floating zone, which can go to a thousand atmospheres. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a second. Whoa. Maybe I hit the mute. I'll try this again. Is it your laptop or the projector? I think it was the projector. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> I didn't want to just try and stretch things out, make people freeze a little longer. <clears throat> hmm? How much more? Maybe five, ten more minutes. That won't work. I'll try and hurry. Time for questions, Steve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah go for it. Yeah, I have a question about the laser based uh, In that the case of the laser, uh, in, in we need the uh, protection of the lasers. But, uh, how do you protect the laser? Mm. Uh, that's um, so you can have a, a beam stop, for instance, that just 
diffuses the light into some metal fin or something, if that's what you're uh, worried about. Um, uh, I'm not sure how they do it in, in the current, you know, in that crystal systems furnace. I don't know how they stop the beam. I assume they have a beam stop that's probably just a cooled black fin metal, or, you know, metal piece that, that they just put some water cooling on it. That's probably it. Uh, is that what you're asking? Just basically how do you stop the laser path? Uh, yeah, so the, it's, a, it's a different part of the, the conversion algorithm. Yes, that would be different, yes. Yeah. Maybe the structures are limited to the number of the lasers. Maybe the, the more, the much laser is, uh, is better to the summary. Uh, the, the yeah. Radiation, so the, yeah, so if we use uh, a man lasers, uh, we can realize the uh, good situation for our temperatures. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, ideal case, the more lasers the better. Uh, it gets a little t tough uh, just, you know, dealing with different laser systems and aligning them. Uh, there should be, you know, there, there's some practical cutoff at some point. Also, you, you can't have one laser independently shining down the light path of another. So you have to kind of tailor things that way. But, um, I'm happy to talk to you more about sort of design considerations later, but yeah, the, ideally more the better. Okay, sorry for the delay. All right, okay. So, um, so what, what are the pressure limitations, right? I mean, I, I showed you sort of, uh, here are sort of the high pressure installations, right? Why, why, why is this difficult? Um, and it's really just difficult because uh, what you're doing is you're focusing broadband light through a large solid angle onto some molten zone, okay? And what that means is that Whatever chamber I have that houses my growth atmosphere has to be f optically transparent, okay? Um, and so I have to have a large solid angle of optical access. Um, and that means that uh, basically what I'm doing is, I, you know, I have this quartz tube here that I'm growing inside of, and that's not the most structurally stable material. Uh, and so if I want to try and go to higher pressures, then what I do is I thicken the quartz tube. For instance, uh, here this would give you something like 10 atmospheres growth pressure. If I make it really thick, then you can go to maybe 50 atmospheres. And then, okay, if I switch from quartz to sapphire, then you can go to 150 atmospheres. And then if I make that really big, then you can go to 300 atmospheres, okay? This is the, the idea. This is brute force scaling of this, of this large solid angle of optical axis, okay? Um, <clears throat> and all the high pressure, all the commercially available high pressure floating zone furnaces are based off this technique, which I mean, what, what's, what's, uh, what's old is new again, this is, you know, originally from Balbashov in, you know, in, in the early 80s, I think even before then, this design of this vertical geometry which he developed actually allows for a compact floating zone. You can have a squat quartz cylinder and you can go to 100 atmospheres, for instance, okay? I mean, I think in his case it might be sapphire. Uh, and this is the design that Scientific Instruments of Dresden really like, pr uh, took off and commercialized and made very effective. And so their first uh, installations being 150 50 atmospheres and the latest being 300 atmospheres. And this is uh, at the Paradigm facility in Hopkins. Okay. And again, the, the key is that you have this upper reflector where it's taking all the light and then it's basically focusing it into this, uh, uh, into the molten zone and you can have this uh, reasonably solid, uh, fully transparent cylinder for your growth chamber, okay? So <clears throat> this increases your pressure stability and you can just scale to thicker chambers as, as you want to, okay? But this really m remains a design that's inherited from the late 1960s, okay? Uh, so one thing you can think about, and this is one we've, what we've been working on, is that you can just simply say, okay, I want to move away from this uh, s cylindrical sapphire silica uh, growth chamber and I just want to move to windows, okay? So I can have discrete windows um, and I know I can make super high pressure windows because you put them in submarines, right? <coughs> um, and you can have sapphire windows or fusilica windows and if I do that then I can have discrete points of optical access inside of a metal chamber and a hundred, a thousand atmospheres is easily attainable for high strength steel. Okay, it's not really a large pressure for steel. Okay, so what's this require? It requires, okay, laser heating, because we want, high, it requires high power laser heating sources, and they need to have wavelengths that are compatible with some high strength window material. Okay. So the first thing we did was we, uh, we designed the, 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 the growth chamber, 
And so this is just a growth chamber. Uh, the key ports here is that it's a metal growth chamber, so we can cool it. We can cool the chamber it's itself directly with water cooling, and we can put seven bores for the laser light to, be, to come in. So these are you know, five millimeter bores, and these are bores where the windows just thread in. Okay, so we, can, we designed some high pressure windows that we simply just thread in there, and the high pressure window is just a sapphire plug now, and this is just uh, Inconel. Uh, NPT thread. And, you know, NPT is you know your household plumbing thread. It can, it can actually hold really high pressures, surprisingly, with uh, Teflon tape. <clears throat> um, and with this design, we can reach uh, 15,000 psi or about a, a thousand atmospheres in the chamber. Okay, so one of the design challenges really, and this is something we worked with Scientific Instruments of Dresden on, is that they adapted their uh, translation mechanism to our furnace chamber and the, the challenge is if you want to translate across a high pressure differential it's very 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 difficult to do that smoothly without slipping like frictional slippage right I mean so in the low pressure systems like a 10 atmosphere system you're just basically translating a shaft through a, uh, an o-ring with some with some silicon grease on it and that can hold the 10 atmosphere pressure and you have really minimal slippage but if you're talking about a thousand atmosphere then you can't really go across that pressure differential so what you do is you simply put everything at the same pressure okay you put the uh, the the shafts at the same pressure as the as the sample and you simply then make a, a pressure chamber in which you remotely couple to the shafts magnetically okay and then you just magnetically translate uh, the shafts up and down and they have a very clever way of also rotating the shafts via quadrupole magnet inside Okay, so this is the idea. So then you basically adapt this to our chamber, and we can make rebreakable seals. Um, uh, this is a metal metal seal. Uh, these are seals that are very standard, like in the oil gas industry, like when they, they have like oil pipelines, they have to open them and close them in the field. And so you can have rebreakable seals that go high pressure, high temperature, and in pretty severe environments. And so you put it all together, and what the assembly looks like is you have this central growth chamber with a uh, laser lights coming, uh, optics focusing laser light into the center of the chamber, and you have a upper, upper and lower translation shafts, which are basically these magnetically coupled shafts. Okay, and this is just the, we, we use a later laser heating array, we use industrial lasers. These are just some coherent uh, 800 nanometer systems that are fiber coupled. We just take the light out. Oh, it's, it has good long-term power stability. Uh, so we just take the fiber coupled light, and then we can control what the focus looks like via just simple conventional optics. So we can control the horizontal and vertical focus on, onto the melt zone uh, as we'd like. Uh, and this is just the heating profile. And this is a student simulation of what the, the power density looks like as you, as you rotate along the, the, the shaft direction. So basically looking at the uh, oscillation. You can't see it so well here. But anyway, it's for seven lasers, so it's uh, fairly uniform. Uh, I'm trying to hurry a little bit because I'm running out of time. <laughs> Uh, another key, imp key component uh, is that you need, uh, for these high pressure systems in particular, you need an inner shroud that basically keeps things that are like spit off from your growth or volatilization from hitting your windows or for ruining your chamber. So we'd have some inner shroud we've designed. Uh, it also serves as a nice cold trap for va vapor. It distributes the heat load, makes things nice, and then it gives you some sacrificial windows. So we put these little five, uh, five millimeter sapphire windows here. So if they break, I don't care. I can buy them from Thor Labs for like 20 bucks and I can replace them. <clears throat> and this is what the assembly looks like. Uh, you know, this is the sort of a cons uh, the cartoon. Uh, here's what the the actual picture. Um, we we actually monitor the growth via out of plane ports. So this is a with a pyrometer and a CCD camera. Uh, and this is sort of taking a step back. This is the the the, the furnace and uh, the bank of lasers here. Okay. So we commissioned with a number of different materials. Um, I'm going to maybe just like highlight a few for the few minutes I've got. Uh, so, but we, you know, students love growing ruby, so it's usually what you have them grow. Uh, uh, gadolinium titanate is a nice commissioning material because it has a very low viscosity melt, and we can actually show some advantages of using the combination of high pressure and laser laser heating to try and stabilize this material. Uh, neodymium zirconate is a good example for collision, uh, uh, collisional damping of volatilization, uh, and this is a, a system. Uh, this is the. Um, uh, this quantum spin chain system where you actually need high oxygen pressure to stabilize the right material. Okay, so gadolinium titanate is a you know, quick example. This is a system that's interesting as like a sort of a canonical MOT, MOT phase where basically as a function of... Hmm? Oh yeah, sorry. So for to copper oxygen, 
uh, what is the building temperature of that system? Uh, I think this one is, uh, I want to say like 1400, something like this. I'm not 100% sure. Lithium, lithium is evaporating around 800%. So how do you do the laser, uh, heating? Because laser temperature can be higher than this lithium evaporation. Yeah, I mean, you do get some volatiliz volatilization. Uh, you t we typically compensate by adding a little more lithium into the feed rod. Yeah. So main model for high pressure is reduce the uh, evaporation or increase the melting temperature? What does the mean? It has a number of effects. So one is uh, you can have some collisional dampening, damping of the volatilization. That helps a lot, up to about 100 atmosphere, let's say. And then the other things can be to change phase diagrams, phase stability, for instance. That's a, a different effect. If you have a reactive gas and you're changing chemical potential, yeah. Good. Uh, all right. So, gadolinium titanate is an example. I only want all I want to say here is that uh, this system has been of interest as sort of a canonical MOT material. It has interesting uh, magnetic phase transitions as you change the tilt angle of these octahedra. Uh, by changing the ionic radius of the rare, rare earth site, for instance. These systems, because of the uh, high molecular weight and the low viscosity, they're actually kind of hard. So the previous state of the art was you basically had to take an unreacted rod and hang it there and not move anything, don't rotate anything, and just slowly translate. Uh, we tried it in, just by adding some moderate overpressure, say 35 bar, and with the laser furnace heating, this was easy. Okay, I just want to, I just want to say the combination of laser heating and uh, a moderate overpressure makes a lot of systems much easier to grow. Okay, uh, here's another example. So precious metal oxides. These guys are known that uh, as you go up in temperature, uh, the oxide will decompose into the metal. Right. Um, so, sorry. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so basically, you have a decomposition of a flux or target materials under low pressures of oxygen. So you have to increase oxygen pressures to basically stabilize, for instance, like 5D precious metal oxides. Um, but then there's also this balance you have to strike because then you can introduce volatility in a high oxygen environment by uh, allowing the formation of things like here, this is the case of ruthenium uh, oxide. You can introduce, for instance, the formation of RuO3, right? You can start to volatilize that way. So you really need this balance between the two. Um, and so what, uh, one of the systems has been investigated for a while is this bilayer ruthenate strontium through ruthenium 207, uh, which uh, is an interesting system. It's a marginally stable Fermi liquid. It's close to a ferromagnetic instability. If you add a little bit of pressure, it becomes a ferromagnet. Or if you add a little bit of impurities, it often becomes a ferromagnet. And it has this uh, sort of pneumatic or spin density wave quantum critical point that you can access via magnetic field. But it's a good example of a system that you can only study with floating zone grown crystals because you really need the ultra high purity to really see the essential physics. Um, but when you grow it, the RuO2 goes everywhere. Okay, so. Um, Really, uh, Robin Perry is the you know, world expert in growing this and really established a lot of uh, growth parameters under sort of like a 10 atmosphere growth environment. Okay? So what we can do is we can compare with those optimal growth, how those optimal growth parameters change as a, a, a function of overpressure as we go even higher in pressure. And what we find is the takeaway is that basically uh, even at only 1,000 PSI, we can reduce the, number of, the amount of excess ruthenium that you need to add to the melt by half. Okay? So you're already having a big effect. Okay, so I just want to highlight a few things. Uh, this is just another example of a, 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 a zirconate a pyrochlor system. It's of interest to a number of different communities. Uh, for instance, uh, thermal barrier coatings, uh, quantum, you know, people, it's an interesting uh, magnetic moment fragmentation system. I won't go into that too much. But anyway, uh, under high pressure, basically you can suppress the volatility and you can, uh, you can basically get crystals that have lattice parameters that match the powder. That's the key takeaway there. That as we scaled up pressure, uh, the, the, uh, you actually get the, uh, you, you can mitigate defects. Um, okay, and this is sort of the last example I just want to highlight, is that one of the questions you can ask is alumina, right? So we can commission uh, alumina. This is just high purity uh, uh, aluminum oxide. Uh, we can melt it and then pull a, a crystal, and it's you know nice, high purity, transparent. One of the students dropped it, so it has this crack in it. Sorry, but the <clears throat> but the key, the interesting thing is you know it has it's high melting point material, and I'm using 800 nanometer light to melt it. Okay, and it has a a large gap. It's transparent, right? 
So how do how does it melt? <laughs> right? or, you know, basically, obviously, you know, in the polycrystalline form, uh, you have you know boundary scattering, right? So you can scatter the light that way and you couple to the light. But it's this really interesting nonlinear behavior, right? So as we're heating up the, the, the material, so this is the feed rod, this is the seed rod. So we're heating up the feed rod, and this is 50 watts, okay, of power. This is 50 watts per laser. So there's seven of them. And the, uh, the pyrometer doesn't register any temperature. Okay, so that means it's less than 1,000 C. Okay, all right, so then we keep increasing the power. We hit 90 watts, and the thing melts. Okay, then we come back down. You can come all the way back down to 18 watts, and it stays molten. Okay, so it's this very interesting nonlinear effect. And the key is that on these, refract on these like high, large gap materials, for instance, or refractory materials, uh, the key is to get them hot. If you get them hot, then they couple to the light. So that's why in this, uh, this uh, CO2 driven paper, you saw there was an ir iridium winding in there. So they were basically heating up their, their materials first to try and activate the, the light, which was you know, sub-band gap light to couple to the material. Uh, other ways of thinking, so another way you can think about doing this is you can just also add some impurities to one section of the rod, melt it, and then basically zone refine those out, <coughs> which we've also done. All right, I just, I'll finish by just saying there's other complexities to consider. Uh, for instance, Tyrell McQueen's group has uh, done some studies looking at, if I look at a really high pressure reactive gas, uh, sometimes there's ideas that that might start to act like a liquid solvent. So for instance, they have this sort of, I think this is more of a phenomenological plot of saying, okay, collisional theory, as you increase pressure, will, will, will decrease your volatility, but eventually if, you're, if your gas is reactive, you might just start to actually use a, the, uh, the gas as sort of a fluid to basically transport material away and increase vaporization. Um, additionally, uh, convective cells, both inside the molten zone and outside the molten zone in your chamber, are always something you have to worry about. The flow, the flow for this can, in principle, at least outside the molten zone, can be engineered, <clears throat> but modeling that's actually really difficult. <coughs> Okay, so okay, I'll give you my, my, my quick uh, outlook real fast. So okay, high pressure floating zones are, I think are rapidly developing. There's new materials that are being destabilized. Um, higher pressures are certainly feasible. For instance, here's some windows designs that can go up to 2 GPA. Uh, many designs are currently based on legacy ideas. I think that'll be changing in the, in the near future. Um, I don't believe that one centimeter diameter crystals are really needed in research anymore. Uh, with floating zone. Uh, I think, you know, the original motivation for neutron scattering, you can deal with much smaller crystals now. Uh, so the diameter can be scaled down. And I just want to drive home that the combination of laser heating and high pressure is very powerful. Basically, you can have a sharp thermal gradient, a stabilizing overpressure, and this really makes a lot of systems easier to grow. And a nice way I know this is when I go to some, uh, look at some labs and there's a high pressure floating zone furnace that is not used very often. Okay, in their lab. They prefer to, you know, students or postdocs or in some labs are using uh, the standard floating zones because they're easier to use. Okay, in my lab, all my students are only using uh, the, the, the high pressure system we got, okay, that we built. And I have a standard four mirror and no one wants to use it. Okay, so it makes things easier. Uh, and, uh, and also I think, you know, one thing that hasn't been explored so much is that there are actually new processing regimes in general, uh, crystal growth aside, at high pressure and high temperature uh, with a floating zone. Um, and so the future, I think, you know, most issues with lasers can be surmounted via starting materials. I'm happy to talk to you about that. Uh, commercially available, uh, for instance, blue lasers are coming soon. That'll be an interesting thing to try, uh, especially for metals. Um, and I think increased installations worldwide is the key to pushing forward high pressure floating zone. Um, and of course, better understanding of things like high pressure phase diagrams and solvent effects. And I'll just mention that uh, we're starting a, a new NSF center at Santa Barbara, the Quantum Foundry, and we're looking for postdocs or interested p students who'd be looking to uh, work on new high-pressure designs for a floating zone. So thanks very much. <laughs>